Welcome to worship here with the community and the members and the friends of Old First Presbyterian Church. For many of us, it's been a hard week. We've had a number of people in the hospital. A lot of people um, have been struggling with um, some illness, some long-term and short-term. So I just want to say you're held in prayers by many people and hope that you and yours are doing well this week because we're all a little anxious. Um, in San Francisco, the number of COVID cases among those that have been vaccinated before are are rising. And so we're, we're hoping that all are being safe and all are well, and we give our prayers and our concerns to our neighborhoods and um, our businesses and hospitals and just everyone. Um, so asking for peace and calm and joy in the city and in our country and in the world. It's August. I don't know how that happened, but it's a pretty exciting thing to be moving into August. And there's a lot of great things that I'm excited about. The first one I want to say is still at the pantry, the Interfaith Food Pantry, which now is made up of probably um, half community members, as well as members from St. Mark's Lutheran and St. Luke's Episcopalian and the Unitarian Universalist and Calvary Presbyterian Church. And we have folks from Christ United um, Presbyterian Church. Just a lot of people were giving food away to about 350 families a week. We also, one of our members, if we have leftovers, shares it with people that he knows needs it. Just want to thank you um, for all those volunteers and all those that help and for the guests that come and remind us, we always have enough to share. Also want to tell you, we have a treat in preaching today. Reverend Marcy Glass is coming to preach for us. And Marcy is um, the pastor now at Calvary Presbyterian Church, just up the street, a sister church um, with us. But she's also a co-moderator of the Covenant Network. And this is a group that has worked for the full inclusion and ordination of gay, lesbian, um, transgender, um, queer folks. It's just a wonderful organization. And um, it helped, um, it got its start with Old First Presbyterian Church and many other people in the Bay Area, and now um, really helps the wholeness of the church around our nation. And Marcy's preaching, and I'm just excited by that. Also want to tell you that in the next four weeks, um, we're going to be doing a theme called um, I Have Been Meaning to Ask. It's a series on curiosity and courage and connection. And it's um, the artwork and some of the liturgy will be coming from um, um, Sanctified Art. We've used their resources before during Lent and Easter, and we're and I'm kind of excited for that. So be looking forward to that. You'll get some things in the email. I, I'm hoping right now we're going to have a little bit of it, or you've seen a graphic about it. I've been I've been meaning to ask. I'm the pastor's kind of be jazzed to preach um, that theme, and that's always a good thing. And want to remind you that on. Um, August 15th, we're going to be live streaming from the church. You all are still going to come in um, and to see that come in online. And so you'll get a link during the week um, or probably really on the Sunday before about how to how to see it. Um, probably something on our um, web page too. I want to tell you, it's an experiment. We're going to see how it goes. This church has never done live streaming before and really I... I've never done it before. We want to see how it works because we're figuring figuring that in September, probably on the 12th, we're going to start cautious um, and compassionate and careful worship in sanctuary. I'll, and so we just want to practice a little bit, work out some details, see how the, um, um, the streaming works. So I'm going to tell you it's probably going to be a crazy day. Well, maybe you can't tell, but it's the first time I've done worship in the sanctuary and 
you know, close to a year, and a half, two years. You know, it's been a long time that we've been um, sheltering in place. And um, we're just going to have to see how it goes. We're learning. I want to tell you that when we do open up for worship, we're hoping that again will be in September, that we are asking everyone to wear masks and are just are assuming that you've had your vaccination shots. And if you haven't, we invite you to join online for worship because our goal is to keep everyone safe. So just a, you should get kind of excited about those things coming up. Um, I also want to say I'm thankful for Covenant Network. They've given us a sermon this week, and they're giving us a sermon on Labor Day, and that means that I'm going to actually take a vacation. I haven't taken a vacation in now eight months and didn't take much last year, so um, I'll, you know, do some of the parts of the worship, but we have a guest preacher coming in. Yay! Okay, a little bit too excited about that. But now I'd like you um, to hear a word from Brian Ellison. Brian is the executive director of Covenant Network, and he's just going to give a little bit of welcome and tell us about his organization. Grace and peace to you. My name is Brian Ellison. I am the executive director of the Covenant Network of Presbyterians, and it is our great privilege to be sharing in worship with you this morning. What a joy and privilege it has been to do the work that we do, seeking the full inclusion of LGBTQIA plus people in the life and leadership of the Presbyterian Church for these past 24 years. That work continues. Even as church policies have changed, we have found that the reality of the need, the depth of struggle that many candidates and inquirers and ministers and church members face in all parts of the country uh, is still just as great as ever. We hope you'll join us in that work. You can learn more about the Covenant Network of Presbyterians at covenetpres.org. One of the things we're seeking to do this summer is to strengthen our network of support for candidates and inquirers who find themselves facing challenges in the call discernment and the preparation for ministry process. We want to have a representative of support in every presbytery in the country for those who might come under care in that place. Uh, if you're interested in helping us with that, I hope you'll reach out, visit our website, send me an email, brian at covenetprez.org. You can also uh, find other resources there, including resources for your congregation, how to become more welcoming, how to uh, use more inclusive and expansive language in worship, how to navigate difficult conversations on tough issues, including issues of sexuality. We are striving to equip the church for this new day, this present moment in the church, and we hope you'll join us. Thanks so much for welcoming us into your church. Today's sermon by my good friend Marcy Glass, pastor at Calvary Presbyterian Church in San Francisco and former co-moderator of our board, is sure to inform and educate and to encourage and to challenge. Thanks so much for letting us be part of your church today. Lead a life worthy of calling to which you are called. We cannot do this alone. We dare not try this alone. So we gathered as God's people. Lead a life worthy of your calling, a life filled with service and meekness. We come to build upon Christ's body in humility and gentleness with patience and love lead a life which reflects your calling that life of peace grounded in the spirit we rejoice in our openness in christ we would share the grace offered to us live a life worthy of the calling to which you are being called. We gather as God's family, setting a table of hope where all are fed, where all are welcomed in body and spirit.
Dwell among the 
them that the Lord God might dwell, might dwell among them. Thou art gone upon Thou hast led captivity captive, and received gifts for men, yea, even for thine enemies, for thine enemies. God might dwell among them, that the Lord God might dwell among them, that the Lord God, that the Lord God well among them my twelve among them that the Lord God my dwell among them Let us pray. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Guide our hearts, guide our minds, and lead us into your truth this day. Amen. Our scripture passage is from the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians, verses 1 to 16. Listen now for God's word to us. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and in all and through all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts God gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the full measure of the stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro, blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
So we don't know much about the origins of this letter to the Ephesians. It likely was not written by Paul, even though his name is on it. The vocabulary and the understanding of the church is not quite the same as it is in the letters that we know he wrote. In some early copies of this letter, it doesn't even say anything about being written for the church in Ephesus. But whoever wrote it, we pause to say thank you to them because they have given us an important insight into the development of the church after the time of Paul and how that early church struggled with and worked through how to be church together, how to live in community with other people who like Jesus, but maybe that's the best thing you can say about them. I mean, I trust you all know what I'm talking about when I say that. Being in community is hard. After a year and a half of primarily being an online community, I also want to affirm that being in community is amazing and it's wonderful. I missed people. I have missed singing with people and praying out loud together. I started a new call during the pandemic, so I am just now, a year later, worshiping in person with my new congregation. I'm just now starting to meet them in person and not over Zoom. I'm just now having people drop by my office, which I confess, it used to sort of bug me a little because I couldn't actually get any of my work done when people just stopped by. But I know that visiting with people who just stopped by is actually what my work is. And now I'm like, come in, have some candy. Can I get you a drink? Stay a while. I'm just so happy to have people back in my life. And as we slowly return from this pandemic, I've been talking with the congregation I serve about how to make sure we return well, not just return to what we always used to do, but to discern what do we need to leave behind in the past? What needs to be changed? What have we really missed that we really want to return to as soon as humanly possible so that we can have healthy and meaningful community? I wish our whole country could do that in truth, to look with some discernment at the ways we interact with each other, the ways we fill our days. I don't want to return to being overscheduled and in pretending that was a virtue. I want to return to good community, meaningful relationships with people who know and love and care for me. The letter to the Ephesians is not that long, and I invite you to read through it all this week. Um, its opening prayer is some of the most beautiful language in Scripture. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which God has called you. The letter talks about faith in Christ, the faith of Christ, which has broken down the dividing walls between us, and then we get the passage we heard today about our intentions, our instructions, how we're called to live this life. I beg you, he writes, to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. I'm guessing you don't need to say those words to people who are busily leading lives worthy of their calling. You say that to people who are making bad choices, people you feel are running out of options. When do I use the word beg? Not very often, to be truth, to be told. It's, a, it's kind of a sketchy parenting strategy, because if your kids know you're going to come to them begging, then what incentive do they have to do what they know they should be doing anyway? I did say it recently to some beloved family members. I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling to which you have been called and get a vaccine against COVID, even though you think you're young and healthy and will be fine. I beg you. I may also have badgered and cajoled and bullied them, but they got their first dose and are scheduled for their second, and we can all be grateful for that. We don't know exactly the situation in the church when this letter was first sent, but it does sound familiar, doesn't it? 2,000 years later, we're reminded that being church has always been complicated and messy and lovely and irritating 
and challenge, all of it, all along the way. After the writer begs them, he then uses the word one, a whole mess of time, reminding us that we've been called to unity. Just in, think, just in case they might think that chaos and division are just fine with God, he calls them back. He calls them to unity. We've been called both to a purpose that rises above our individual wants and desires and to a purpose that uses our individual gifts and desires to build up Christ's body, the church, and to equip the saints. I wanted to skip over the oneness and unity part of this passage because blah, 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 who wants to hear another sermon about unity in the spirit? But in truth, it's the one thing that we may have the biggest trouble with, both in our church and in our culture. Unity is hard for me, in truth, unless I can find some way to define it as we are unified in agreeing that Marcy says everything correctly. And I know that there is no possible definition of the word that works with that. I guess I'm maybe more of a typical American than I want to believe I am. We seem to be really solid on the word one, as in unbridled individualism, and we're much less clear on one, as in there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Our culture is full of illustrations of, well, I want X, Y, and Z for me, but I'm not gonna be inconvenienced for you. I don't want my money to benefit you. I don't care how or if you survive. I'm taking care of myself. And the writer of Ephesians has some opinions about that tendency of ours. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about, he says. Instead, we are called to use our gifts to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ even the members of the body of Christ that we don't know or who we think we don't need. Simon Sinek says, faith is knowing you're on a team even if you don't know who the other players are. That's not a bad definition for us to ponder. Faith is knowing you're on a team even if you don't know who the other players are. We aren't called to cookie cutter sameness or to pretend that there aren't real differences between us. Unity in Christ doesn't require us to stop being who we are. In truth, it requires us, it calls us to acknowledge the particularities of our gifts and callings, and then to focus those toward unity, toward building up the body of Christ, to building up each other in love, recognizing we all belong to each other. We are invited to speak the truth in love, he says. And that may seem like a very simple instruction, but I think it is the most important and the most difficult thing we are called to do. We live in a shallow culture of truthiness and image. But if we want to be one in the spirit, we have to be honest with each other about who we are. We have to both tell our truth and we have to listen to and receive the truth of others. What truth in your life are you unsure that you can speak in love? People hide their truths for many reasons, maybe because of shame or fear that they're the only ones that are facing that particular painful truth. Or maybe they withhold their truth because society has made their truth illegal or too dangerous for them. And the hiding of our truth the way we force other people to hide their truth, that is killing God's children and the church has to stand up to it. One of my truths is that in college, I had an unplanned pregnancy. There were a few weeks at the beginning where I told nobody, hoping I would wake up one morning and find out I was mistaken. I was crippled by shame. I was a good church kid. What would my parents say? What would my church say? What would my friends in college say? Would I be asked to leave the school? And if so, what would I do? In my head, I spun out a million terrible scenarios that might happen. And then one morning I looked in the mirror and 
I still can't quite explain how I knew what I knew, but I knew that I could not fix all of my problems that day. But if I could just be honest and truthful about who I was, that I'd get through that day. That I'd get through it the whole pregnancy, day by day. If I were honest, God would help me. And so I told my best friend, and then I told a few others, and then I told the father of my baby, and I flew home and I told my parents. I told the dean of students at my university, and then I told my sorority, and I told my pastor who told the session, who told the church. And all of a sudden, everybody knew my story that had been secret and shameful, and I no longer had to hide. I could just be me, even if me was the pregnant girl on campus. I still think of that time as the great unburdening. There were a very few people on the sidelines of my life who offered unhelpful comments, but the vast majority of people and all of the people who cared for me and cared about me offered me love and acceptance when I had been expecting shame and rejection. Maybe the biggest surprise came from the people I didn't actually know that well, who stepped up, who cared for me, who bought me lunch, who typed up my papers so that I could sleep more, who loaned me clothes to wear, who made sure I came to the sorority functions. While I couldn't encourage, well, I would not encourage anyone to go out and have a challenging life event in order to experience the character building and the grace that I experienced, I will say it shaped me deeply to speak my truth and to be accepted as I was. It taught me to extend love to myself and to value and honor my relationships. It taught me to care and to dream with hope for my unborn child. I placed my son for adoption and I have been privileged to be a part of his life all along his journey too. He is now 32 years old and he and his wife are expecting my granddaughter this coming month. Back at the beginning, when I was spot spinning out all of the many ways the story might end, none of the scenarios included this one. Because shame and silence keep us from imagining the best future God is trying to dream for us. I recognize speaking your truth is never easy, and it might not be safe. People can lose jobs and relationships when difficult truths are admitted. You don't need to write your truth on Facebook. Really, you don't. And you don't need to shout about it on a street corner. But can you tell one person? Is there one safe person you can bring your truth to so you don't have to carry it alone? For too many years, our denomination kept people from speaking truth in love. Before 2011, when we finally allowed for ordination for people of all sexual orientations, Good and faithful people who were called by God to serve as pastors had to hold their truth in secret or face losing their jobs. Brian Ellison, who is Covenant Network's executive director, is a dear friend of mine. We've known each other a long time, and he describes the toll that our ordination restrictions took on his relationships with the congregation that he served. He came out to them before he left to join the Covenant Network, and he said the most challenging talks were not with those members who had moral concerns about my being gay. The heartbreaking moments came in conversation with those who would have been supportive if only they had known. They were hurt because even though I was with them in their most vulnerable and special moments, in premarital counseling, in baptizing their children and burying their parents, I was not fully open with them. The church's prohibitions and my own fears drove me to inauthenticity. As I have celebrated the changes in our denomination in recent years, and friends, it is worth celebrating the changes, but my heart still breaks for the people for whom the changes came too late. 
It is why serving on the board of the Covenant Network is a privilege and a calling. Before we can speak the truth in love, we have to know our truth will be received in love. So how can we as a church build a world where people can speak vulnerable truth and have it be received in love? One thing I learned when I was honest and vulnerable about my truth was that it connected me to people. Most other people had not experienced the same truth that I was going through, but everyone had some experience of shame and a fear of exclusion and judgment. My story gave them space to look at their own stories differently, and our lives and our stories became connected. The author of Ephesians writes, Speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. If we want to be one in the Spirit, joined and knit together, it has to be around real and vulnerable places in our lives, the places where we can let God in and acknowledge our limitations and failures and work for redemption. In our world right now, we seem to join and knit together around the people we exclude, the ideas we fear, the causes we champion. And that is not what the author of Ephesians is longing for. It may feel good in the moment to rally with others against another group or another idea, but it is not the joining that leads to unity in the spirit. So can we join and knit together, not against others, but for them, trusting we are on the same team? Can we join and knit together to form the whole body of Christ, joined by every ligament with which it is equipped to promote the body's growth in building itself up in love? I'm not promising it is easy or glamorous work to build honest community where people can bring their whole selves. But it is the only way I can see for us to get through the shallow world of connection in which we often find ourselves. Speaking the truth in love is how we grow toward Jesus and grow into becoming his body in the world. So I pray that we may all have and build community that is joined and knit together in love and truth. Think of the world we could create. Amen. We are now going to say together the last part of the brief statement of faith. We've been doing a part each week. This is the first statement of faith that the United Church did, the Northern and the Southern Church, when they re reunited in um, the mid-80s. You will find a copy of this section on our Facebook page or just, you can Google PCUSA.org and look for a brief statement of faith. Leading the um, statement today will be Lisa Robichek, our parish associate. So now let us join our voices together. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life, the Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through Scripture, engages us through the word proclaimed, claims us in the waters of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men to all ministries of the church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of peoples long silenced, 
and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen.
friends, may you be strengthened in knowing you are a part of a community. You're part of the body of Christ. That means you're part of something bigger and call, God has given you a special role to do. You don't have to do everything. You don't have to be all knowledgeable because we're doing this together. So may the God who knit us together in, the, in love be with you this week. May you follow in the ways of Christ who longs for us to be built up in full stature, not children who can't make up their minds, but strong individuals who grow in love and strength. And we still have the Spirit who helps us to grow, who helps us find the right path, who promotes growth each and every day. Thanks be to God. Amen.